that was adopted in the uh, Conference on, uh, on Sustainable Development uh, held at Rio in, in 2012 said, a call for SDGs that are action-oriented, concise, and easy to communicate, limited number, aspirational, global in nature, and universally applicable to all countries while taking account national, uh, different national realities, capacities, and levels of development in respecting national policies and priorities. This is a kind of a inherently self-contradictory statement that you can have such a thing, um, but that's what they try to do. So I think that the strength and the, the simplicity, measurability, concreteness, uh, these are the um, strengths and weaknesses of the MDGs. And the, 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 the problem of simplicity, I think, is essentially that of um, distortion. It's not simply simplification, but simplification becomes distortion. And what I think is most important is to look at what is not on the, these lists of indicators, whether it's the MDGs or SDGs. Uh, there are many issues that are not on the list, and therefore, they become off the table for policy debate. As my colleague Alicia Yemen says, you know, the maternal mortality ratio as a target drew attention to maternal mortality as an important neglected priority, but it actually cast a shadow on all the other priorities for maternal health and reproductive rights, even, for example, family planning. So um, I realize I have too many slides, so I'm just going to go through some of them and not really focus on each, every single one. Um, so uh, what I have done um, with some colleagues, uh, and particularly with Alicia Yemen, who is uh, at George, uh, Georgetown University now, uh, is to do some research on uh, the MDGs. And we used, we were very inspired by recent literature in social sciences, uh, particularly in the field of the sociology of knowledge, um, on indicators as tools of governance. And there is a long history uh, of uh, so social science research, particularly uh, by anthropologists, on the effects of quantification. And what they point out is that um, the power of numbers comes from the fact that you know, they, they are imbued with this aura of uh, scientific certitude, that if you say half the proportion of people who are poor you sound like you have arrived at this uh, social priority scientifically uh, by real analysis, by rigorous analysis, uh, and that it can be done and that you really mean to do it. Um, so it gives this kind of, as a communicating device, it gives this uh, aura of uh, scientific uh, exploration and rigor uh, and concreteness in your, your determination to achieve it. And so as indicators of um, governance, as a, a public policy tool, um, they, can, um, they can exert influence on the behavior of others. I mean, after all, the United Nations uh, General Assembly sits and adopts these goals, and it's just a piece of paper there's no reason why anybody should pay attention to it. Uh, this is not, you can imagine that a corporation can set a sales target. The CEO says the target is to increase sales by 20%. The CEO therefore can allocate uh, budgets and other resources to achieve that target and give instructions as to how to achieve that target. Well. This declaration adopted to the UN doesn't have any link to any other such organizational mandates to actually achieve the targets or any allocation of resources or anything of that kind. It's just an international agreement of an aspirational nature. But they somehow work to exert influence. And this is why uh, I think it's interesting to sort of trace the, what those effects are. These, these numbers actually set a standard, a standard of behavior, a standard of performance. And so that creates an incentive 
for countries and other actors to do well, um, in part for reasons of um, reputation in the international community. And um, uh, they, um, uh, the more that you monitor performance using these indicators, the more uh, the incentive is uh, made stronger. Uh, and actually, it is rather interesting uh, now that I have spent 24 hours in Valencia uh, and have chatted to just a few people that my, my uh, sample, about five people, have all told me how uh, uh, the SDGs are being talked about as uh, something that the um, local government should be doing something about or the universities should be doing something about. So this is a sort of a standard that is communicated as a as a framework for um, good performance. Um, so somehow they've create, already created uh, an incentive and they were adopted a year ago. They, um, they, but they also have these knowledge effects and these knowledge effects basically def redefine these social realities and social priorities. Um, and as I have already mentioned, they have this problem of uh, redefining through uh, simplification, reification, and abstraction. And so um, this, um, I'll just speak very briefly about our project uh, where we did 11 case studies of uh, individual goals and or, or targets and uh, there were 11 case studies ranging from a study on the hunger goal, the employment goal, um, education goal, gender equality, child um, um, survival, maternal health, and, and so on. And um, so what each one actually looked at, um, the uh, traced the trajectory of the norm, where they came from, uh, and how that norm kind of evolved, how that concept got redefined. Um, and then um, we looked at the impact on um, discourses and uh, narratives of development, for example, the na narrative of gender equality and what you have to do about it, the narrative of hunger, what hunger means and what you have to do about it and the, uh, the choice of indicators that were used and the effect, incentive effects they had uh, and the alternative indicators that could have been used. And we found that in terms of the, intent, the policy consequences, uh, of, uh, in terms of the policy objective of mobilizing support, um, some were successful, but in fact others were totally ignored. Um, for example, HIV AIDS was very successful, but employment, food, partnership, those goals were not at all. And I think it has a lot to do with who championed them. Um, but I think the more interesting issue is how they actually distorted policy priorities and ideas. And um, so, as I mentioned in the issue of maternal mortality, uh, the fact that maternal mortality ratio was selected as a goal um, created a, uh, an incentive to finance number crunching uh, exercises. So people who are making estimates and arguing about estimates got huge amounts of funding in university. Um, and of course, uh, there was no additional funding in development, so it was sort of additional funding, uh, it, this additional funding for this number crunching had to come from somewhere else. And um, so this analysis shows that there was this kind of a narrowing down of funding priorities onto um, a sort of a technocratic agenda. And, uh, but also that this was a very inadequate uh, indicator to choose because it's very famous for being extremely unreliable based on rather, um, well, the, the estimates uh, based on very little information. And of course, you cannot disaggregate things that are basically synthetic indicators. Um, there were also important um, effects 
in terms of um, redefining concepts. And I think that the, the women's rights groups were particularly concerned by the way that the, uh, the goal basically reduced women's empowerment uh, and the idea of development to this parity in school enrollment. Um, and something like sexual and reproductive health rights, which has to do with the rights of women to make decisions and to choose, came to be framed as uh, this maternal mortality ratio, something that could be done through technocratic change. Um, so, um, and there was a lot of uh, criticism about the choice of targets that they were just kind of thrown out there, like 100 million slum dwellers, which is uh, a tiny proportion of people estimated to live in slums, like two billion or something like that and um, often inconsistent with international human rights standards, uh, not aligned with many development priorities. For example, um, climate change was not there, employment was not really a goal. Uh, on the other hand, the number of telephones was. Um, indicators that were impossible to disaggregate and indicators that created perverse incentives. Um, and uh, for example, uh, um, improving the lives of 100 million slum dwellers was, imp uh, was kind of literally interpreted and uh, it meant uh, bulldozing away these slums. Um, and um, the use of uh, weight uh, for height indicator for hunger actually um, so sort of uh, encouraged calorie laden feeding of children. Um, so there is um, uh, there are a number of problems we find in the way that the indicators were, were chosen. So just very quickly to just say a few words about uh, one example, the hunger goal. Um, this had very little, there was an, a goal of um, reducing, I think by two thirds, the proportion of people who were undernourished. And um, this was only a target, this wasn't a proper goal, it was a sub-goal. Um, and um, it had very little effect uh, on um, this priority that was actually for a long time neglected during the 1990s and 1980s, during uh, which time world food prices were very low. So the international community was not interested in this goal. But then, of course, it was the, ninth, the 2008 food price crisis, the, the commodity price hikes of the 2007 and 8, that actually drove attention to the problem, not the MDGs. What I think is most interesting is that they had a knowledge effect. Once there was an effect on um, international attention, there was a redefinition of food security. And, uh, Food security is actually, def was defined in 1990s as the ability of people to access food. That there is, uh, Amartya Sen says, you know, there's a lot of food around, but there's a lot of hunger. Well, why is that? It's because hunger is not, is not a problem of there being food. Hunger is a problem of people not having a, the ability to acquire it, either through purchase or pr own production or being given it through some social transfer mechanism. Um, but now what has happened is that the hunger food issue has become reframed as production commodified and uh, with this kind of a short-termism target-driven approach, can we feed the world? Um, and I don't want to go too long into this, but we analyze the way in which um, things like um, Production was only a very small part, that's the top line, of uh, part of the um, resolution of the 1990s conferences uh, on food. Um, those resolutions, international resolutions, emphasized economic access, um, distributing access for dis disadvantaged groups, vulnerability to food security, participation and accountability, things of that kind. 
Um, but now you have this very productionist view of the problem of hunger. And this is just um, an illustration of the list of the kind of international initiatives in, that we have and the new trends uh, talk about results orientation, private public partnerships, environmental and sustainable agriculture, private investments and technology. Uh, and technologies, for example, fortified foods. So um, reducing hunger, not by empowering people to acquire food, but by feeding them fortified foods. And I think there's a kind of a reframing of that narrative, the discourse of hunger. And this is the 10 largest agriculture and nutrition grants in the Gates Foundation, the biggest source of um, financing in the area of food and food security. And a lot of it is actually going to American universities doing research in um, like biofortified staple crops and things of that kind. And this also then raises questions about what should be the criteria for selection of indicators. In the international uh, uh, processes uh, that select these indicators for things like the SDGs and the MDGs, you have groups of statisticians and development uh, specialists working to select them on technocratic grounds. And of course, they will always go for data robustness, uh, data availability. And, uh, but that is ne not necessarily um, what you want because um, in fact, the kind of data that you want depends on the use to which you want to uh, put them. And, and I think this is maybe a little bit too complicated for me to go, go through, but whether you are trying to um, to uh, use data for political communication, monitoring progress, monitoring for human rights accountability, or for programming purposes, uh, you would have quite different views as to what was needed in terms of scope, level, quantification, and focus. For, for example, for, uh, for quantification, you want concrete and measurable objectives, if, uh, indicators if you want to use them to communicate uh, an idea for, for support, mobilizing support or for monitoring progress. But if you want to use indicators for monitoring human rights accountability, uh, you want to have um, concrete and measurable data, of course, but also qu uh, non-quantifiable and qualitative data are important. Uh, and similarly for programming uh, purposes as well. So th th this, I think, I don't really have time to go into all of those, those details, but um, I, I hope that my, I've, um, uh, I've been able to explain my, my concern that these quantitative indicators are rather treacherous when you uh, use them as a methodology for setting international consensus uh, priorities. Um, they certainly set standards of performance, but they can also redefine context, create nar narratives and frame discourses. And I think it is actually the, quant the, the instrument itself um, that um, was, um, was problematic. And, I, I, and, I, and, and I, as I was saying to people uh, yesterday, my own interpretation of the political economy of the MDGs and these indicators was that the MDGs were set. They were not, they didn't appear from nowhere. They were actually created by people and institutions and the interests of the institutions and these people, the creators is actually reflected. And the MDGs reproduced a paradigm of poverty reduction, which is very much uh, an idea of what I would call meeting basic needs. Uh, that was an idea of the 1970s, cost, count, and deliver, build schools, build, uh, dig wells, uh, build uh, health posts, and deliver these services to the poor. This was essentially the notion of 
poverty reduction. And I think this is the, the framing that, that we have today because it's a very convenient uh, supplement to a neoliberal economic model where you basically don't touch the economic model that is creating poverty and inequality and exclusion, but that you deal with the consequences of the of benefits of economic growth and globalization that leave some people out. So it's a very much a sort of a palliative approach. And this list of MDGs that we had over the last 15 years is, is very much that agenda that does not include inequality. And uh, the new goals, the SDGs, are quite different because it has many more, uh, it's a more expansive uh, um, agenda. Uh, but I won't go into that. And I think what is interesting is how the MDGs used indicators, quantitative indicators, and the power of these numbers to frame a new meaning of development and to shape discourse. And uh, political scientists say that framing is actually a hegemonic instrument uh, where organizations can use uh, framing of discourse to control debates. And, and that control is, of course, in focusing on things that are important, but also actually putting under the table issues that are inconvenient. So uh, as um, this, um, this quote from um, Boas de Matinha states, um, that this is achieved with the minimum of conflict or pressure. An effective frame is one which makes favored ideas seem like common sense, and unfavored ideas as unthinkable. And therefore, it creates this hegemony frame, thought, and thereby circumscribes action. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, when, um, when we were thinking who our panelist speaker would be, um, so, well, development is not, of course, what we do, but I think, yeah, we think this is going to sound well. It's going to sound familiar. It has sounded very familiar. And uh, I wouldn't say almost as scary how many parallelism are between the problems you face and the issues you have uh, underlying. And the issue we face um, is almost the same. So the power of numbers, as, as we know well. Um, one thing which I thought was relevant, you know, you, common, you had a common thread here on the notion of how numbers set the standards of performance, and they said no. And uh, that's something we kind of know, but uh, uh, we forget. And I think in a community like this community that is very, um, have plays a very important role in the development of indicators, this kind of most ethical responsibility of being aware of the importance of what we do in terms of setting a standard of performance and setting norms is something we should always keep in mind. Um, having said that, um, we have, we've done very well. We've been nice. We have not extended ourselves too much. So we have a bit of time. So I think if you don't mind, maybe we could take a few questions from the floor. If it's any, we have a microphone. Do we? Yeah, we do have a microphone. So are there questions? Don't be shy. This is an inclusive conference. <laughs> this one up there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th thank you very much for a very thought-provoking uh, talk. Uh, my name is Michael Kahn. I'm from one of your countries, South Africa. I was really intrigued that at the end of your talk, you got on to the neoliberal paradigm. And you made the point that it shapes the agenda and indeed will shape the way that we construct the indicators. But a reading of the SDGs suggests it hasn't been buried. And I would like you to comment on that assertion. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that the SDGs and MDGs are very different. And um, the, uh, I think the SDGs are a pushback on the MDGs. Um, and because uh, just 
if you look at the process by which the MDGs were created and the SDGs were created, they are very different. I mean, it is this list, but there's also the, 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 the process by which they were created, and that is, of course, an international political process, if you like. And whereas the MDGs were technocratically um, created by a group of uh, um, you know, uh, senior officials at the UN and kind of drawn up and then sort of given to governments to agree or not agree to, um, in fact, the uh, SDGs uh, were uh, created through, um, they were first initially um, proposed by the uh, Rio Plus 20 conference held in 2012, I believe, um, which is, um, which, which I think is, um, includes a constituency, stakeholders of, of the, the environment, um, environment and development conferences uh, include, you know, environmentalists, ecologists uh, from uh, countries of the north and the south, uh, countries like Brazil and Colombia were very active in this whole process. This is very different from the MDGs, which was a north-south agenda. The uh, MDGs uh, derived actually from the goals that were set by the donor countries in the OECD, the OECD Development Assistance Committee, the International Development Goals, and they were kind of elaborated a little bit uh, to be become not a donor's agenda, but a, a, you know, but a UN global agenda. And so the politics behind the creation of these sets of, of indicators is very different. And I think um, as the MDGs uh, went on, as I showed, you know, um, most, in fact, when they were first launched, uh, many NGOs were very lukewarm. Most governments of the South were very lukewarm uh, because they were very suspicious as here was another list of kind of conditionality uh, indicators, um, and um, they didn't really kind of own it. But the SDGs uh, were um, built, were created on the basis of two years of very intensive debate and consultation and proposals. And, and the reason for this open process was because the MDG process was so criticized as being uh, as having lacked any kind of consultation, and because many so civil society groups were um, were um, very were pushing back on the uh, MDG agenda that uh, stripped away, for example, any kind of mention of human rights. So, the um, I think that what you see in s the SDGs being this rather expansive list of 17 goals and 169 indicators is a reflection of the, uh, the process as well. Yeah. And, and the SDGs have a much more of uh, sort of uh, 